good morning. Um, hope everybody had a good Easter and was safe after those storms from this weekend. Uh, today we're talking about World War II, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to do World War II justice. Um, there are some places where this is an entire semester class, and I'm going to try to give it to you in 15-20 minutes. So don't think that what I'm teaching you or showing you or telling you is everything there is to World War II. It's very complicated, very complex, and I encourage you to learn more, or if you go to a four-year school, try and take a history class on this because it's really interesting. There's a lot of moving parts. Well, let's start with uh, this Mussolini guy. Um, uh, Mussolini, he's going to become the leader of Italy in the 1920s. And he's going to start this idea called fascism. And fascism is really, really hard to define. There is a article I used to make this class read called What is Fascism? that was written by Benito Mussolini. And he tries to explain what fascism is, and he cannot do it. Uh, fascism is basically whatever you want it to be. If giving you a new car is going to get you to support the government, they'll give you a car. If giving you a job is going to get you to support the government, they'll give you a job. Um, fascism, it works within the existing government. Uh, it works with the existing businesses. It works with the existing army. It comes to power legally in every single case. Um, for example, Mussolini, uh, he is going to come into power because after World War I is over, Italy is going to feel cheated. It was promised land, it was promised stuff by France and Britain if they fought with France and Britain. <clears throat> After the war is over, <coughs> excuse me, Italy doesn't get any of the land it was promised. Italy doesn't get, <coughs> excuse me, Italy doesn't get any of the power it's promised. Italy is kind of just left out in the cold and millions of people die in vain in Italy. Um, Italy sacrifices a lot in World War I. Um, the Italian economy collapses after World War I. Uh, the money is worth about a third of what it was before World War I. There's the communist revolution and people in Italy are afraid that a revolution is going to happen in Italy. And when we get to 1922, Mussolini and his fascist party, known as the Black Shirts, are going to march on Rome, where Mussolini demands that the king, a guy named Victor Emmanuel III, let him run the government. And this threat of violence is going to be just enough to encourage King Victor Emmanuel III to let Mussolini in and give him the government. Two years later in 1924 there's going to be an election and the fascist party wins this massive electoral victory. Now there was a lot of threats of, of violence, there were some voting fraud happening, but Mussolini is going to technically become the leader legally. The king invites him to become the leader of the government, and then there is an election that solidifies his power. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Mussolini, he's successful as the leader of Italy, mainly because his opponents are really weak. Uh, he is effective with the use of propaganda. He's very charismatic. He holds these big rallies where people come and listen and they just drink up everything that he has to say. But once again, when it comes down to what is fascism, he doesn't really say. Um, Mussolini, he glorifies war. He wants to reproduce the Roman Empire. And he just kind of tries to rebuild Italy in his image after World War I is over. And a very famous quote by him, nothing above the state, outside the state, or against the state. So you can see where his mind is going. 
Uh, Mussolini believes the natural place for women is as mothers. He makes abortion criminal. He closes jobs to women and he encourages large families. Uh, women are going to become, for lack of better words, baby factories. Now we also have Nazism. Nazism is kind of like the big brother to fascism. In fact, Nazism is a fascist government. Uh, this is the one that people have heard more about than, than the other, so I'll concentrate on this a little bit more. Uh, first of all, Nazism is it's hard to define as fascism. Uh, it works within the existing government, Nazism comes to power legally. It's based on the idea of racial superiority. It was thought that the German race, so to speak, was better than everybody else. There was this hatred of the Jewish people. It was thought that the Jews were the reason Germany lost World War I. And that comes from this idea that Jewish people more often than not ran the banks of Germany and the German people accused the Jews of shutting off the money so that the war could not continue. And there's this intense nationalism, this intense pride in being German that breaks out after World War I. Uh, Nazism's also anti-communist and is anti-capitalist. They're kind of their own thing. Now, a big question, why does Nazism rise in Germany? Well, there are many different reasons. After World War I, when the German king or the German Kaiser gives up his throne, there's a republic that's proclaimed, and this is called the Weimar Republic. I know it says Weimar, but it's German, it's pronounced with a V, it's a Weimar. Um, in the Weimar Republic's constitution, there's this weird thing called Article 48. And Article 48 gave the president of Germany dictator powers if there is an emergency. In between World War I and World War II, the German economy collapses. I talked about that last video, I hope you watched it, where people would take wheelbarrows full of money to the store to try to buy bread and they just couldn't do it. And then there's this universal hatred of the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles limits how many soldiers can be in the army. It limits how much power Germany can have. It, has, it makes Germany pay back all of that money. And the Rhineland, if you remember, is taken over by the French. There's lots of reasons why Nazism is going to arise. Now, Adolf Hitler, who was on that last slide, is the poster child for Nazism. And Hitler has a long storied history as well. Um, for example, I didn't put it on here, but in World War I, Hitler was actually a corporal in the German army, even though he was from Austria. But it had been his dream, after he was a failed artist, to join the German army. Hitler is actually injured in World War I. He is injured in a gas attack. And you might be shocked by this, but Hitler's life was saved in World War I by a Jewish officer. Well, fast forward to 1923. In the city of Munich, Hitler attempts a rebellion against the Weimar Republic government. And this is known as the Beer Hall Putsch. Uh, basically, Hitler and some of his friends get together in a beer hall. They proclaim that they have taken control of the government of Bavaria, which was southern Germany. Uh, Hitler gathers a small army, marches this army to the basically uh, capital of Bavaria, and he's double-crossed there. He almost takes over the government in 1923, but he's double-crossed. He's arrested, he's thrown in jail. And then while Adolf Hitler's in jail, he writes his book called Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. And in Mein Kampf, he pretty much lays out everything he's gonna do in the war. Uh, his hatred of Jews, his goals for recreating Germany, creating this Third Reich, the third rise of German superiority. And it's really a blueprint of what he's gonna do. Now, after Hitler gets out of prison, 
he finds the not the national socialist german workers party and the red and those are the nazis and the reason they're called the nazis is because in german it's a nazi and now socialist is deutsche arbeiter parte so national nazi Now the goals of the Nazi party or the National Socialist German Workers Party, number one, they want to end the Treaty of Versailles. They want to repudiate it. They want to rip it up. They want to get rid of it. Uh, they want Germany and Austria to be unified. They want to exclude Jews from German citizenship and they want the government to handle big business. Now this Nazi party is going to become very popular. Nobody liked the Treaty of Versailles. Everybody thought that Austria and Germany should be together. A lot of ethnic Germans thought that the Jews were the reason World War I was lost. And lower middle class, farmers, young people, they didn't like big businesses. The Nazi party is going to be especially popular with younger people. 40% of all Nazi supporters were under the age of 30. And other supporters, lower middle class, farmers, things like that. People who didn't benefit from the Weimar Republic. People who lost all their money. People who did not benefit from businesses. Now how does Hitler rise to power? Well, by 1932, the Nazi party is the largest political party in Germany. The German parliament is known as the Reichstag and within the Reichstag there were 230 seats held by Nazis out of uh, I think it was 450. So they are the largest party. They're not quite the majority. They're just under majority meaning they have to side with somebody else. They have to get help from somebody else to rule but they are the largest party. By 1929, there's an economic collapse. There are over 6 million unemployed Germans. That equals about 45% of their workforce. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unrest. And the Nazi party is going to promise the people of Germany basically whatever they want. If you elect us to power, we will give you a job. If you elect us to power, we'll make sure you have food on the table. If you give us a if you give us your vote, we will restore Germany to its greatness. So the Nazi party and Hitler are going to promise people what they want. So 1933, Hitler is going to be named the Chancellor of Germany. That's basically the Prime Minister. And he's asked to form a government by President Paul von Hindenburg. So von Hindenburg, who is a World War I hero, asks this relatively unknown guy, Hitler, make a government. And he does. <clears throat> oh. Hitler's named Chancellor in late January 1933 and in March of 1933 there's a fire at the Reichstag. There's a fire at the Parliament building. And this fire allows Adolf Hitler to use Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution to declare a national emergency. And this is known as the Enabling Act of 1933. Now it turns out later, nobody knew this at the time, but it turns out later that the Nazis actually started the Reichstag fire, blamed it on the communists, and that gave Hitler the ability to invoke Article 48 and take over. So what did the Enabling Act do? It meant that Hitler could rule as a virtual dictator. He could rule by decree instead of going through Parliament or the Reichstag. What's really interesting to me, and I've always found this interesting when I've studied World War II, everything, with the exception of the Holocaust, everything Hitler did was technically legal under the Weimar Constitution. He's legally appointed. The Nazi party is legally voted in. Article 48 is used legally. It's a scary thought. But Hitler is going to solidify his grip on the Nazi party in June 1934. There were some people in the Nazi party who didn't agree with Hitler. And in what becomes known as the Night of the Long Knives, Hitler and a lot of 
his supporters end up killing the nazis who were not quite as extreme as his group or didn't quite support what hitler was trying to do so what were hitler's policies well first of all fix the german economy he increases the size of the german military he builds factories to supply the military that gives germans jobs almost instantly uh, he begins his public works program with rebuilding the government rebuilding the infrastructure building roads you might have heard of something called the autobahn that was created by adolf hitler and unemployment just drops it's six million people in 1933 in 1936 there are less than 1 million unemployed and by 1937 there's a need for more workers so Hitler creates jobs uh, but this also means that the budget's gonna go higher and in 1938 the budget was eight times higher than the 1933 budget and almost 75 percent of all the money Germany was spending was for its military the other big policy of Hitler is ethnic cleansing, and we're going to talk more about this on Thursday. On September 15, 1935, Hitler starts the Nuremberg Laws that removes citizenship from German Jews. It also closes certain professions from German Jews. They can't be in the military. They can't be teachers, educators, doctors, lawyers, things like that. On November 9, 1938, is a night called Kristallnacht. Uh, or the night of uh, broken glass or a crystal night if you will uh, on crystal knocked um, windows of Jewish stores are broken down synagogues are smashed up and taken apart and that's what starts the Jewish people having to wear the the Star of David on their clothing and then in 1941 Jews are beginning to be deported from Germany uh, 1941 is the, when the first killing camps are set up but even before that the Jewish people understood what was happening and they started to leave uh, on their own by 1938 one and a half or so million Jews have left Germany unfortunately the great majority of them went right next door to Poland which doesn't really do them much good as we find out now what about World War II itself? A lot of what I just talked about was governments that lead to World War II. Well, what do you actually need to know about World War II? Well, here's how it starts. Uh, in March 1935, Germany renounces the Treaty of Versailles. They say that they will quit abiding by it. Uh, Hitler restarts the military. He starts rebuilding the military and Italy almost at the same time is going to attack the country of Ethiopia that confuses everybody and in March of 1936 Germany invades the Rhineland that's the part of Germany that was supposed to be the demilitarized zone where the French had control and honestly Germany and Hitler thought that Britain and France would respond to that but they didn't and that kind of um, emboldened the German government and Hitler to continue with what they were doing. In 1937, Italy and Germany and Japan, they form what becomes known as the Axis powers. It was thought that the world turned on the Rome-Berlin Axis and Japan was thrown in there. And sometimes people ask, but wait, the Japanese weren't German. How were they accepted? Hitler had an answer that he made the Japanese honorary Germans. From 1936 to 1939 there's a Spanish Civil War. Uh, a guy named Franco is trying to take over the government of Spain. Germany helps Franco because Franco wants to do a fascist government. Uh, this gives Germany an opportunity to test its new military. Germany and Spain become secret allies and the fascist government win the Spanish Civil War. In March of 1938, Germany annexes Austria. This is a complete joke. Uh, German Nazi agents are sent into Austria where they advocate for 
an election. This election is going to be held and rigged by Austrian Nazis and Germany and Austria joined together. This is known as the Anschluss. And then finally, in September 1938, Hitler is going to demand a part of Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland was traditionally German. There were three and a half million Germans living in the Sudetenland. And there's a conference in September 1938 called the Munich Conference where Britain, France, and Germany meet. Not Czechoslovakia, but Britain, Germany, and France, they meet. And it's decided to give Germany the Sudetenland in exchange for an agreement that Germany and Hitler won't take any more land. So Hitler with his fingers crossed behind his back says, sure, sure, I won't take any more land. The Sudetenland is given to Germany and then lo and behold, March 1939, Hitler breaks his promise and takes over the rest of Czechoslovakia. Now, I have a map for you because I know this is kind of, what are we talking about? So, um, here you go. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse. This is what Germany looked like after World War I, this dark, I guess, red peach color. You can see East Prussia over here. There's the Polish corridor that allowed Poland access to the sea. There's the city of Danzig or Gdansk. And here's kind of how this goes. In March 1936, Germany takes over the Rhineland. In March 1938, Germany and Austria are joined together. And then in September 1938, this outside part of Czechoslovakia, that's the Sudetenland, that's taken by Germany. And then in March of 1939, the rest of Czechoslovakia becomes German as well. So just in a matter of two years or so, Germany is going to greatly increase its size. And that's kind of the, the walkthrough that leads to World War II. Now what's the final straw that actually starts World War II? Well, there's some actual causes, and these are going to sound familiar. Uh, the causes of World War II are generally the same as World War I. I hope you found in your research as you're working on your SLO that World War I didn't solve anything. You still have nationalism. You still have militarism. You still have imperialism. You still have alliances. Uh, like nationalism, I've got it here. Pride in the winners. The winners of World War I are kind of gloating. They stick it to Germany through the Treaty of Versailles. Um, the losers, they want to maintain their country's autonomy. They want to recreate the pride of their country. They are hurt by the loss. You got militarism. The winners want to maintain this superiority, this military superiority that they had. And the losers, they want to rebuild their military so they can avenge their loss, so that they can do better next time. Uh, you still have imperialism. There's still this need for wealth and resources. The colonies in Africa are still going strong. But then you have Japan. Japan needs colonies. It needs resources. It needs wealth. Italy is trying to rebuild its its empire that is kind of weakened in World War I and Germany is trying to build an empire from scratch and kind of create its greatness again. And then alliances are a big one. Germany, Italy, and Japan, they feel left out. They feel um, looked down on so they're going to join an alliance. And then Britain and France, they're the victors. They're gloating. They join an alliance and create an alliance as well. And eventually the Soviet Union and the United States are going to be forced into that alliance, although it was unplanned in 1939. Now, what was the immediate cause? Germany invades Poland September 1st, 1939. And that was a joke as well. Um, the Nazi government uh, secretly takes over a Polish radio station in the middle of the night and then broadcast that Poland was invading Germany and Hitler tries to make it look like Germany was defending itself from Poland. 
but everybody knew that was a joke. Poland's a new country. Poland's military was no match for Germany's military. And Poland had no desire to do anything. Now, fighting the war. The reason Germany invades Poland is because there were a lot of Germans living in Poland, and much of Germany used to be Poland before World War I. Another part of it, uh, there's a secret deal between Germany and the Soviet Union. Uh, Germany and the Soviet Union, they, in, they decide to split Poland in half. So at first, the Soviet Union and Germany look like they're going to be allies. Uh, Germany, he, they use this new form of warfare that you've heard of now called Blitz, Blitzkrieg, which is lightning war. Uh, what Germany would do is they would have heavy armor, they would have tanks rush in before anybody knew what was going on, and then the infantry would come later and basically just clean up any people that that uh, the tanks lost, left or missed. Blitzkrieg is so effective by the, that by the summer of 1940, Germany has invaded or completely taken over Poland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and France. In fact, France is able to fall in something like six weeks faster than anybody thought. Um, in June of 1941, Germany launches something called Operation Barbarossa, and they double-cross the Soviet Union and invade the Soviet Union. Uh, France becomes a... German ally, although the French colonies in Africa, they remain what are called free French and they fight against the French government. So you have kind of like a French Civil War in the middle of World War II and not, not a lot of people talk about that. But there is a free France versus what's called a Vichy France. That's V-I-C-H-Y. And there's a big deal there. Uh, by 1941, the war is going to spread in North Africa as well. There's going to be Germans versus British in Egypt and Algeria, and they're all trying to fight over control of the Suez Canal. Now, Japan. Uh, the Japanese war is going to start as early as 1933 when Japan invades China, and that is the, the Nanking Massacre reading talking about that. Um, Japan and China are going to fight each other. Uh, Japan is going to take over some British colonies, some Dutch colonies, some French colonies as they expand larger and larger. Um, Japan and the United States are eventually going to come to a, a disagreement in late 1941. And Japan is going to bomb Her Pearl Harbor December 7, 1941 with little warning. Uh, believe it or not, there was some warning. Um, it was not completely out of the blue like people think, but the warning was very short and people didn't believe the warning was really the problem. Now, within six months of the United States entering the war, the United States is able to stop the expansion of the Japanese territory. Uh, the turning point of World War II is generally seen as Midway Island, the Battle of Midway. Uh, Germany's armies are stopped in the Soviet Union at the city of Stalingrad. Uh, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, he basically says this city will not be taken. And the Battle, the battle of Stalingrad goes from August 23rd of 1942 to February 2nd of 1943. The fighting is hand to hand, city to city, sometimes room to room. Uh, one half of a building could be German controlled, the other half of the building would be Russian controlled, and they would fight over individual rooms and buildings. Eventually, though, the German advance is stopped, the Germans are forced to retreat. And then you have something called Operation Torch. That's the United States invading North Africa. That occurs on November 8th, 1943. So you in Africa, you've got the American army, on the west side of North Africa, you've got the British Army on the north, on the east side of North Africa, and they're going to kind of squeeze in the middle until North Africa pops, so to speak, like a balloon. Now, the end of the war is going to happen fairly quickly once the everything gets going. Um, Germany never could win on two sides. Um, the Russian army. If you are a fan of the U.S. Army in World War II, this might break your heart a little bit. Russia, the Soviet Union, could have won the war by themselves. They actually did not need the United States. 
but the United States made it happen quicker. Uh, the U.S. is going to invade Italy September 3rd, 1943. Mussolini is actually killed. Uh, Mussolini is going to be uh, murdered. The Italians surrender, and the German army is actually going to invade Italy and take control of Italy. Um, Normandy, also known as D-Day, that happens on June 6, 1944. It's the biggest invasion that the world has ever seen. Uh, watch Band of Brothers, watch um, Saving Private Ryan. All of those are pretty f accurate and fairly good depictions of what happens at Normandy. But suddenly, Germany is being squeezed from both sides. The Russian army on the east, the U.S., British, and Free French Army on the West, and Italy is going, or not Italy, but Germany is going to be squeezed until they have to surrender. Uh, Germany surrenders on May 8th, 1945. Hitler kills himself just a couple days before that, and the surrender of Germany is an entire lecture in itself. I mean, the German army turns around and fights against the Russians while trying to make a deal with the U.S. and and there's a very very good book called The Fall of Berlin 1945. If anybody's interested in more information on that just send me an email but that a book it's called The Fall of Berlin 1945 it tells you everything that happens. Um, in Japan the atomic bomb is dropped it's a new invention um, it's created by something called the Manhattan Project, which spent billions of dollars to develop. In fact, the atomic bomb was so expensive that it had to be used, basically. That was the view of the government. Um, interestingly enough, the scientists who worked on the atomic bomb, once they realized how destructive it was, they begged the U.S. government not to use it. And President Harry Truman basically says, we have to use it because we spent all the money. So the city of Hiroshima is bombed on August 6, 1945. The city of Nagasaki is bombed on August 9, 1945. Even after that happens, the Japanese government did not want to surrender. And it took the Japanese emperor overruling his council and making a public plea to his people via radio message to surrender. And that was unbelievable because the Japanese emperor had never been heard by the Japanese people before. So they could not believe it. It was like in Japan, the emperor was seen as a god. So basically it was their god telling them to lay down their weapons. And the official surrender of Japan happens on September 2nd, 1945. Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, for next class, we're going to talk about the Holocaust. So please make sure that you have read the mouse book so that you have an idea of what we're talking about because I'm going to discuss that. Also make sure that you have read the article One Day in Josepho. That is one of the best articles that I know of that shows you how pervasive, how widespread the Holocaust was. Also, uh, your word of the day is going to be museum. So your word of the day is museum. Secret word, museum. Why is museum your secret word? Because you have to start thinking about that museum review. Now remember, you can't actually go to a museum anymore because, well, everything's closed. But there is that list of virtual museums. Or you can do the historical film as well. Um, However, if you did get to a museum before everything shut down, please do write about that museum. You don't have to redo it. Um, but I encourage you, go ahead and start getting those in. Go ahead and watch your movie. Go ahead and look at your virtual museum. Uh, go ahead and start getting those in now, especially since there's not really a whole lot else you can do. Hopefully you are still social distancing and staying at home. I know I am. Um, also, keep working on your SLO. And um, remember, that's going to be due here in a couple of weeks as well. All right, until next time, that's all I got for you. We'll see you soon.